Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. For those of you who are regular listeners, you might have noticed that the last couple of weeks I've put out some rebroadcast episodes. I have just taken a short break to catch up on some other work and I'm back again with a fresh list of new episodes coming your way in which, as you know, I'll be interviewing many types of economists with diverse backgrounds in terms of their research and their writings. And first up in this week's episode, I speak to Aryo Klammer, who is Professor of Cultural Economics at the Erasmus University, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And in part of this conversation, I discuss his most recent book, which is Doing the Right Thing, A Value-Based Approach to the Economy. And we explore what this book means in terms of looking at the human perspective of the economy and organizational processes. In other words, what Aryo has done is he wanted to find out the human aspect, the humanization of people who are part of this micro and macro economy. And it harks back to the work on Adam Smith, who looked at the theory in his theory of moral sentiments, the idea of altruism and reciprocity, rather than looking at the bottom line, which is profitability motives by firms or a human's self-interest in terms of their wages and their salaries and what they can get out of it for their for the work or the labor that they give to the firm. Aryo is questioning that there must be more and there has to be more than the salarization or the profitability of firms. What is what are the underlying reasons or the motivations for humans and can we actually humanize the organization or the firm? And this is something that the classical economists and philosophers would have looked at. And even Aryo has identified the work of Aristotle as a, a means for questioning our relationship with one another and how we interact in systems. And this includes a system, the economic system and the system of a firm. We aren't necessarily motivated by money or by the salaries that we could be given and should we really be pushing more towards that human aspect the the family the friendships that we have the culture that we build up and he explores different aspects of human motivation and when he goes into and identifies with and he it only he admitted that he never really identified it at the beginning when he was given the task of looking at economics from the aspect of culture and arts and he figured out eventually that people have different motivations rather than be motivated by salary their motivations are being accepted or being critiqued by a community of like-minded individuals. And he has recognized that artists are one of these type of people who thrive on being associated with other artists and who are critiquing each other's work. And it's not necessarily painting and drawing and creating a piece, a piece of artwork for payment. It's more so being accepted in that community and establishing themselves within that community and being recognized and appreciated for their work, for what it actually is and for what it stands for. And I think this is important because we, as our individuals, we all, ex we, are, we should be expected to value our own self-worth and our own type of behaviors, whether they're altruistic, whether we have a non-egotistical outlook, even though we may associate firms or CEOs that had that type of egoism. So we are more motivated by these type of values, which are immeasurable or are considered qualities rather than looking, as he suggested, was quantities and the quantities perhaps being a measure of output for a firm or a measure of wages for the labor that you put in and this is the return you get for your input, we find it very difficult in economics to measure these type of values, these qualities that we appreciate with one another 
as friends, as family members, as associates or colleagues in work. Um, some people are motivated to work, not necessarily based on the carrot on a stick approach, whereby the salary or the the money is attracting us to this type of work. So Ario Clamour uh, explores in his book about looking at that value process and whether we should be adopting a more value-based approach to the economy and to do the right thing as a person or as an organization or even as a society to strive to be a better individual, a better firm or a better society collectively. And these are some of the themes that I have explored with other guests on the podcast, including Russ Roberts, as I mentioned here, who wrote about how Adam Smith can change your life and the altruistic nature that we as humans have inherently in our approach to being mindful or being mindful of others or being mindful of yourself and even being mindful of the environment and of ecology, which is another other themes that I had explored with other guests, such as Jason Shogren or Deirdre McCloskey. It was another person and Herbert Gintis. So these are some of those other episodes, and it's it's through these through this exposure. Personally, I don't know whether I can speak for yourself, but personally, when I am more exposed to these types of conversations, it's it's all coming together. And I see that based on my own experience of teaching economics or having read it or learned it, that we are missing a very large section of trying to understand what economics or what the economy is. And some of the behavioral sciences that we're now adopting is a very welcome approach to understanding this aspect of it. But unfortunately, this was something that we had over the last number of centuries that the economic discipline had. But we have moved on to a more, as Professor Klammer had suggested in this episode, a more abstract approach to things through our calculus and our diagrams. And that's all fine because, you know, you would like to quantify and be able to illustrate how the certain aspects of the economy work. But with John Maynard Keynes' general theory book that was published in the early 1930s, there was a section in it called Animal Spirits, which was largely ignored by the economics discipline because it seemed too soft relative to the hard facts or the theories and the calculations that would have been expected by the economics discipline at that time. And again, this is something that Professor Klammer had suggested was a very insightful or maybe even a turning point for him when he first came across the general theory by Maynard Keynes when he was a student. It was that chapter 12 on animal spirits that really captured his love for the discipline. And it was that connection that eventually brought him around to writing the work on art and culture, the importance of it to the economy, and also looking at the human aspect of the economy and the, it, it has always been there but never really analysed or measured or discussed in the discipline. So his aim is to do something and leave a legacy behind so that we can actually learn and build up on our understanding uh, maybe even adopt it as a way of understanding our approach or even understanding how firms actually operate or should operate in the economy. So I'm not sure if I had done this bit of a blurb any justice to what's ahead. So Professor Klammer has discussed his work in this episode on pretty much what I had mentioned here. If this is something that you're interested in, keep listening. It is something different. It may not be something that you expect in economics. And if this is something that you are read in or you're researching yourself, I'd love to hear from you by going to the Economic Rockstar website and adding a comment to the post that is related to this episode on economicrockstar.com forward slash Ario Clamor, which is A-R-J-O-K-L-A-M-E-R. And Ario has his own website, clamor.nl, which he has a list of all his books and his publications and the research that he's doing with his PhD students who are working on this type of research in economics, which is, the again, the human perspective on 
the economy or on art and culture too. Um, don't forget, if you want to support the show, to continue pressing play, share the episode with colleagues, friends, family, whoever you might be, you whoever you think could be interested in this episode or any other previous episode that you have listened to. And if you're unsure what are, what's available, check it out on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or go to, to my own website, economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. And I have a list there of all 160 episodes available for you to choose from. So there is has to be at least one or two there that could resonate with you or your work. Um, again, if you would like to support the show financially, check out patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar and there you'll be given choices as to how you can support the show for as little as $1 a month. And I'd love to hear from you maybe in a more informal setting. So check out Facebook, Twitter and Instagram which I'd be putting up just a couple of posts, maybe even sound bites from an episode, and we can connect that way. And don't don't forget to subscribe to if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe, you'll be getting notifications directly of a new release on an episode, so you'll never miss one. And if you can, just please leave an honest rating and review, and that will help the podcast get more recognized and noticed, so others can find it. So again, thanks very much for continuing to listen. And again, check out the back catalog on any podcast platform. So enjoy this episode with Professor Aryo Clammer. Thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Aryo, for uh, coming on and to the podcast and spending time with me. Well, of course, I, um, I'm looking forward to it. What I actually love and what really drew my attention to you and your work is how different it is to what we actually expect in economics. And I suppose with my exposure to people on this podcast, they have similar backgrounds in terms of talking about the importance of ecology, of environment, and one or two mentioned about culture. But I never really got to explore it as much. And I think or I know you are the person to talk about culture and the importance of culture to us in the economics discipline and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. And like, why is this missing in economics and why did you gravitate toward it? No, I don't demiss uh, economics, but I uh, am critical of economics as this uh, sort of phrase in textbooks, uh, as it was sort of, uh, imagined by especially Lionel Robbins in 1932 uh, to make us think that economics is all about choice and about scarcity and allocation of resources. And that's the standard definition. But that's really an invention of, of um, uh, that came into the discussion in the 30s. And I'd like to go back and, and sort of uh, consult uh, the, the the classical economists, but even go back to someone like Aristotle, but also uh, Adam Smith and uh, Thomas Aquino and uh, more recently uh, sort of Keynes, uh, Deirdre McCloskey. And, and then I get a very different perspective. And um, I try actually to, to revive economics as a moral science. In the 19th century, economics was taught by, by ministers. And the big question was basically how to live a good life. And is it right to work for a wage? Is it right to ask a, a price, even though that you know the product is defect? Is it right to set up an organization? Uh, and th these are the questions that people ask themselves in daily life. And uh, because of sort of the turn that economics took as a discipline in the in the 20s, 30s of last century, uh, yeah, economics has become an abstract science yeah, with models and. And that really is distant from the questions that people have every day, whether they work for a bank or are at home or figure out what kind of job to take. And I suddenly it hit to me how strange it was that we don't sort of um, look at through the eyes of people having to figure out the life, their life. And that's sort of the, the focus that I take in my recent book, Doing the Right Thing. You mentioned there about the, I suppose, the, the timeline of economics, how economics has evolved and gone into this yeah. abstract type science. But what kind of really kicked off for you to make you aware of this lack of uh, moral science or lack of culture? Well, yeah, the, 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 I think what, uh, there are several things I could mention, but I, um, 
when I came, returned from the United States to the Netherlands, I got the chair in the economics of card, art and culture. And so I was asked as an economist to, to pay attention to the world of the arts. And so I sort of did several uh, talks uh, to uh, audiences of artists. And I began, as you do as an economist, talking about markets and demand, supply and all that. And I got rather visceral, rea visceral reactions from the audience. Uh, artists can be straightforward, but quite clear that they were not sort of uh, didn't uh, didn't get what I was saying, but they actually were offended by it. Um, they were saying I was not doing justice to what they what preoccupies them. And first, I thought they were stupid. Uh, just uh, obstinate, uh, not willing to understand uh, all what uh, we as economists had to teach them. But uh, it slowly dawned on me that maybe I was missing something. And I was not um, understanding what uh, was involved in their life. And one thing is, whereas as an economist, I, I think about, uh, I use now the word valorization, but uh, that valorization for them really is to make money with their art. But that was not their main concern. Their main concern was to valorize the art by uh, sharing it with other artists to get uh, critical responses to be uh, um, appreciated uh, by their teachers or other artists, by critics, to be taken seriously as an artist. That was far more important, at least at that stage, uh, than selling it. And that sort of got me thinking. So, and, and I... And I have been turning to then to cultural economists, my direct colleagues, and I found rather resi uh, quite a bit of resistance to this. So I saw that as an anomaly, as a challenge that I had to address. Mm. Because it, it is an anomaly, as I say, because it's something that you wouldn't explore and find in a typical economics course or theories that are outlined, because how could you produce some work and not request a price or a salary from that. You'd rather go and be criticized and be taken seriously as an artist. So that there's a gap in the economics literature yeah. because of that anomaly. Yeah, and that anomaly, then once I saw that, I also looked at my own life. I talked to other economists a great deal about it, like Dir McCloskey, who's a friend of mine. And um, I said, it's kind of strange. Um uh, we economists are very much focused on the transaction. Uh, we always talk about uh, th that we, we produce things in order to sell them, and then we call the buying of, of stuff uh, consumption, and that's it. I said, but that's not, if you are uh, critically looking at it, that's not how I experience it. Um, for example, I'm talking now with you. Uh, there's no transaction involved. No one is paying anyone. And actually, this is sort of an, a rather standard kind of thing. Uh, my whole day today existed for of of doing things with other people, um, starting off, of course, in the morning with my 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 wife and my kid, and um, and I realized actually that a lot of value gets generated uh, by doing things uh, away from the market in what I call the oikos at home uh, that I got from Aristotle, and in the social sphere, and and what we do then like you and I talking or uh, what I do with my wife or what I do with my friends or my colleagues, we, 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 we in a way contribute what I call, and that's a real invention. I don't know anyone who sort of addresses this and that's sort of weird. Um, we contribute to what I call a shared good, uh, a shared practice that is valuable for us, is costly to generate, but is meaningful. And that is, in that sense, comparable to um, yeah, a refrigerator or a car or a computer or whatever else is useful. But for some strange reason, uh, we economists uh, don't pay any attention to it, don't even see that, don't even recognize that. But once you see it, then you realize that most activity that you and I are engaged in is to contribute, participate in what I call these shared practices, including art. These artists uh, work their whole day sort of being part of that practice that's called art, that they share with other artists, art critics, with people interested in it. And as part of that, indeed, they produce art. And indeed, they have to make a living. Some artists are able to uh, generate uh, money with their art. Uh, but that is not, for many of the artists, actually not the game. The game is mostly 
to participate in that shared practice and to be recognized it and to be seen as a serious artist. That's like I am involved in my home to be considered to be at least by my wife and my kid as a serious member of the household, as a good father. And but this my colleagues as a good colleague, and you and I are producing a conversation that satisfies both of us, and that's valuable for you and valuable that's for you and for me, and we co-produce it, you could say, we co-create it. And what I find, uh, and that's what I spell out in doing the right thing. I find sort of amazing. Once now I have the notion, I go around and ask my colleagues, uh, "Do you recognize this?" And so far, whomever I ask, they say it's interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. But yeah, there is nowhere in the literature that this is addressed. People could say it's addressed in perhaps the voluntary market, but that's not the same thing, is it? No, no, because the important thing is that there's a different logic involved. And that's a logic, I, I call this the willingness to contribute. The economists always talk about the willingness to pay. But actually, what is much more dominant is the willingness to contribute, for people to participate by the way, that also takes care of the, the famous sort of uh, egoistic, altruistic issue. Mm. Uh, in, in the standard sort of frame of economics, altruism is sort of an anomaly. It's kind of strange. But in this, if you see it uh, by way of shared goods and shared practices, altruism is actually the standard. Yeah. Because you participate and contribute without clarity about what the return is. And that's actually what we do every day throughout the day even the so-called great egoists don't do, do it uh, and that is the rather normal part of everyday life and what i do in a shop um i learn to do it to sort of learn behavior but that is uh, certainly if you operate in amidst artists but also scientists and uh, psychologists and, and those kind of group uh, the market type of behavior is sort of uh, uh, somewhat odd, somewhat abnormal that we have to do, but people don't find it comfortable with it. Whereas, of course, other people love it and, and uh, they, they don't get enough of it, but uh, like in the uh, financial sector and so on. But in, in a great deal of the sector, and that's what, what and that's where we're studying the art world that triggered me, in the art world, there's a great resistance to it. Not always. Some artists like it, like the game, but most artists resist it, and I understand it because the point is not to make their art into a product, but they want to, it to be a shared practice. Mm -hmm. They want to uh, look for a process of what we could show, say co-creation, uh, that you then co-create an art field, like I co-create with colleagues culture economics as a field. And that is actually the normal behavior. And this is, I, I just recall a part of a conversation I've had with Russ Roberts of Econ Talk, and he's okay. He he has written books a book on Adam Smith. I think it's how Adam Smith can change your life, and he talked about that the importance of altruism, the how to be a yeah. good person, um, that 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 was all part of the classical thinking in terms of Adam Smith's the theory of moral sentiments, and as you correctly pointed out, economics have become very much abstract and theoretical based and that we have removed all of this type of um, morality and ethical issues. No, we haven't removed it, but it's become quite, it's become shadowed or overshadowed by the calculus and the abstraction of diagrams to illustrate economic right. theories and processes. And therefore we are, as economists now are in general being trained to remove ourselves from this altruistic behavior, this type of culturalism, the way we can't associate a certain activity because we cannot monetize it or sell uh, What is it you call the salaritization of yeah, an activity? Valorization, valorization, I call it. But valorization in the original meaning of the word means it, to realize values, to realize, and that's how I define values, what's important to us. So if uh, you and I want to... Uh, have, we, we, we are curious about, uh, interested in knowledge about the economy, but that we have to valorize. So what we do, uh, now you have your pat podcast. I, uh, I write, I make, uh, I write books, I write articles, I teach, uh, I do all kinds of things as you do. Uh, and all these things are meant to valorize the knowledge that we generate, the insights that we get into the economy. And that's what we do. Hmm. And so now and then I sell something. So now and then I sell a book, which is nice. Uh, but that's not my point of writing a book. Yes. I write a book, of course, because I hope 
that the knowledge is picked up, that it enters the conversation and people, uh, it inspired people to think uh, in different ways about the economy and then I'm, I'm happy. Um, and the, the, the income is secondary thanks to the university who pays my salary anyway. Mm. So, uh, but, but, but it is sort of, as you, you mentioned, uh, Adam Smith, uh, and Adam Smith is an important source of inf- uh, inspiration, and indeed people go to the theory of moral sentiments. But I also suggest go to the wealth of nations and go to the famous phrase uh, where, about the butcher, brewer, and baker, uh, that, that we appeal to their self-love, yep. um, uh, and not, uh, not, uh, and, and not uh, uh, sort of that we call uh, their, their attention to our needs. But just in the paragraph above it, he says that in, in normal life, everyday life, we prefer to appeal to um, the support of our brethren. Uh, that, that, that is what we do, like we do at home, we do with friends. And to Adam Smith, that is the normal. But because in a complex world we cannot do so, because I don't know someone who uh, uh, so, shows uh, clothes or uh, bakes bread, uh, that's not in my immediate surrounding. It's nice that I have a baker and an, a clothes shop that I can buy my clothes at and my bread. But that is not for Adam Smith the ideal, but it's simply a solution to a problem that we get. But the ideal is that I have relationship with other people and that we share things that are important to us. That's his ideal. Mm. And that's, that is, and that's also for me. So I try to develop a framework that does justice to the things that are really important to us, like a family, like art, like science, like community. And I find that that is, that requires a concept. Um, actually, I, I, I saw Menger sort of play with it. And he said, yeah, we should actually consider friendship as a good, but then he dismissed it because there is no market for it. Well, we and know there is a market for that, all right. No, yeah, there is in a way. There social is. media. Um, yeah, social media, you could say. Um, but um, but it's sort of strange that, that on that those grounds, you dismiss actually interactions that I have that are most relevant um, and produce a great deal of value for me. Um, and to make the point the other way, um, this is what I use with in conversation with economists. I say, okay, usually we sit at a, at a, at an, uh, at a restaurant and we sort of, uh, talk and share all kinds of stories and ideas and so on. I say, then I ask my, my, my colleagues, I say, what's now important what we do here? Now, clearly the conversation we have, uh, the, the, the sort of friendship, what we share. So that's not interesting. I, I totally agree. But, in our science, we don't, we are not interested in that. The only thing we are interested in is that one of us is going to the cash register, pays the bill, and that counts, and that we're going to call consumption. Whereas, um, and that co- ends in the box and gets added to the uh, national income accounting, and that goes into our computers, and there we run our models. But we ignore what we all agree is the essential part of what we do. The consumption is, yeah, we ate our food. That was nice. Thank you very much. But that was more an excuse to have the conversation that we have. So the most important thing, yeah, what really adds to our welfare, we leave outside the discussion. And we have decided to call that an externality or something like that. Mm. Now, it is very strange that the essential we leave out, yeah, we, we call exogenous or outside the model. And I say, well, then there is something fundamentally wrong about the way the lens that we look at uh, with, through which we look at the economy. There's a, a beautiful article I've came across before. I don't know if you ever heard of the website brainpickings.org. Uh, Maria Popova, I think, uh, is the person who looks after that. But she wrote an article no. um, based on the German, I, don't, I think he's a German philosopher, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer yeah. And he looked at the difference between um, art and science and how they're actually interrelated and that this creates some kind of um, beauty in terms of there should be an overlap between the two of them you, you really can't isolate one from the other there is if you can visualize a venn diagram and an overlap of the two circles one representing the science and one representing the art and she, uh, Maria in her article referred to Albert Einstein who had these dreams and these visions and it was very creative and was able to 
analyze his thoughts um, through his mathematical derivations and saw yeah. those dreams um, come true. And like an artist, they create those um, those types of art dreams or whatever it is, those that creativity on their own uh, canvas as opposed to the, the blackboard and identifies how important um, the, the two disciplines are um, and that they should be actually complementing and to complement one another. That's right. Yeah, I would call them uh, in my sort of, I have a sort of a model and there's a picture that I draw and I say this, these are art and science are sense-making activities. Uh, by way of art and by way of science, we try to make sense in some way or another of our world. And to do so, and that's quite critical, uh, I refer in my class to someone like Shikshen Mihai and Amabile, uh, for, in order to be able to make sense in a sensible way, you have to sort of create, yeah, I call it a conversation, other people call them discursive practice, but sort of a context in what I say and you say makes sense. And the same is true for artists, because you cannot create art by yourself. You cannot create knowledge by yourself. And the others are critical. And now, uh, if all the words that we use here, uh, we really benefit from having a conversation that's called economics or culture economics in order to make, make sense and that people understand what we say. And so you're quite right that there is a big uh, sort of similarity between uh, the sense-making activity that we call science and that we call uh, art. There are also important differences um, because uh, what makes sense in one doesn't make sense in the other. I always look for intersections uh, like you do and like uh, happens in this article. I always like that when, when artists and scientists sort of try to meet and figure out what they have in common. I like those kind of discussions. Um, and indeed, you mentioned Einstein, but you see, especially music and mathematics, for example, uh, often goes well together, mm. uh, I notice. Um, and that has something to do with the nature of music, I think, uh, as with the nature of math. Um, but I, yeah, but, it, but I see it actually as part of sense making uh, activities. And when you broaden it, you see actually a great deal of sense making activities. And newspapers are part of it, politics is part of it, advertising, um, and sort of, they all in a way influence the way we imagine our world. Some are hopefully more important than others. And now it's, of, of course, a big battle as to what does science really contribute and what do the arts contribute uh, to our sense of the world. Uh, but those uh, questions I'm um, uh, seriously interested in, how that works. Ario, your current book, which picks up on all of this, um, Doing the Right Thing, A Value-Based Economy, you are in this one, you're looking at, the human perspective on economic and organizational processes. Yeah. So again, is this when you look at when you're when you look at the human perspective of things, is this looking at the the morals and the ethics or the cultural aspects of people or even their their altruistic behaviors that it tends to be removed from our economic thinking when it comes to how an organization or an economy behaves? Yeah. Yeah, I I do a lot of uh yeah, I do all kinds of programs with uh, professionals, uh, uh, law firms, accounting uh, firms. And um, I have also sort of an academy for people who are sort of advanced in their career. Okay. Um, and um, what I figure is that many of these people who have professional lives um struggle with uh, sort of yeah, basic, you could almost say existential questions. Mm. And, um, and, and that's basically question, what is that I'm doing good for? Um, and what I, what my analysis is, is um, what well, my analysis is that we are caught up in a very instrumentalized uh, uh, mindset um, that means that we focus on instrumental things like money and, and uh, income and, and financial wealth and things like that. Um, but that, that that doesn't help us to answer the question, what is that what I do good for? Mm -hmm. And many corporations right now are asking them the same question. 
Uh, there are all kinds of crazy big companies, also here in the Netherlands, uh, Unilever is well known for it. There's another chemical company, or it's now more a broader company, DSM. But there is sort of uh, also in these companies sort of a, what I call, we call a value-based approach, that people try to figure out what is the purpose. Uh, Mike Moore in Harvard makes a big point of that, public value calls it. It remains rather vague. And in the doing the right thing, I try to become more concrete. And I, I, I give a sort of a classification for four domains where we can sort of uh, identify the, I call that praxis, so shared practices that, that have the purpose sort of contained in itself that we can uh, point at and articulate as that what we strive for. And it is sort of fascinating to do these exercises with professionals and see how utterly confused they are. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they mention all kinds of things that are vague. Uh, but once you are clear about uh, the, the, the practice you want to contribute, there is much more clarity in, in what people think is right. And, yeah, I call this more in the vein of Adam Smith's uh, a moral approach or a value-based approach to economics. And I find, and again, I, I got this from the artist. Because artists, too, ask them all the time questions, what, what is right? Is it right to have an, uh, a businessman leading an, uh, a museum or not? Uh, um, should we sort of um, get sponsorship by large companies or not? Um, and what is the best way of financing uh, this new artistic event? These are the questions that, that prevail. And... Um, and standard economics, as I call it, the one that we mentioned, doesn't provide answers uh, for questions like that. And is actually quite uh, irrelevant. Uh, that's, by the way, something shocking, too. I was uh, in a sort of political job for a while and dealt with the labor market. And I found that there was actually no use I had to virtually everything that my co uh, economics in, uh, colleagues in economics had produced on the subject. Because the questions that you face are, are moral questions. Um, what is the right thing to do for people? Mm. And um, so I developed, therefore, a framework that, that makes sense of that and also gives some direction. So with this framework that you present to individuals or to organizations, and it's mostly to organizations, is it? Are you... Yeah, also, yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously, well, no, obviously, you, it's tried and tested. You, you've done your background. So they could follow this framework if they experience maybe an existential crisis within the farm uh, to identify who the, who the farm is, what direction they're going to go into, um, and then to embrace the family type, um, culture that may be lacking in an organization because they've focused on other things like, profitability and we as individuals working within that type of organization could become quite removed from the goals of yeah. the firm because we don't feel as if we're being valued as such and even though you may get a pay rise to reflect that value it's not about the money because any incremental change to your salary is not going to match the incremental change to your happiness or your well-being or how much you feel you're being valued or appreciated. So other that, things such as, uh, fi you know, finishing at 3, p 3 p.m. on one particular day or, I don't know, um, being part of a group activity f um, f that offers maybe a relief work of voluntary work or in family days out, something that's quite inexpensive relative to your salary could, or even even a, a pat on the back, like a, a, quite literally, um, showing a show of appreciation, could be worth more than to you than an incremental change to your wage. That's right. Yeah. This. See, but this, by the way, I, 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 at the moment, developing an what I call a quality evaluator with some other people. Um, because it requires a very different way of reflecting on how well we are doing uh, as individuals, but also as organizations, as, uh, but also as societies, as nations, as cities. Um, and you can do it on, on all levels. And, the, and the, the answer we want, and economists sort of try to push it into welfare, 
uh, as a concept, uh, but that is not satisfactory because that remains an abstract uh, concept. But the important thing is first that we address what's really important, what qualities do we stress, and then the quality ev evaluator, just as you described, tries to figure out whether we are indeed able to, to realize the qualities that we find important, to what extent do we actually do so. And what I find is uh, the, the most important qualities, I think, and this is certainly true in the Netherlands where I now work, are of a social kind, uh, that you contribute in some so social practices with colleagues, with friends in, in local communities. They're uh, societal, so they pertain more to a societal level. That can be the ecology where you started off. That can be education or civilization or justice or uh, things that are relevant or equality uh, relevant on a societal level. Then there is a transcendental level. That's the higher. That's the ultimate, of course, where uh, it, it, that's what we can have experience in religion, sometimes in science, sometimes in music, sometimes in nature. But we feel that we sort of uh, connect with something larger than than this year and often overlooked and forgotten is the personal qualities that we are able and that's what you were referring to see what's most critical in an organization often certainly in the artistic organization that i study is that people are realize their craftsmanship or their artisanship uh, something that they're good at and that the university in my case enables me to teach and to write things that i like to do and i think i'm pretty good at it and that's what the university enables me to do. And there's also a purpose of university to provide that. It's sort of silly that the university only is de uh, dedicated to uh, the fortunes of our students. Um, uh, that's not, um, uh, that, that's what, what people say in sort of neoliberal, ne neoliberal mindset. But it is also important that all the, 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 uh, the, the scientists, the scholars can develop their skills in university. And, uh, but that also applies the roles I have. Uh, you t mentioned the volunteers. So I, I appreciate the, the, the societal role I have. I also like to be a good father. I want to be a good friend. And these are important goals that I strive for. So you have in four dimensions, you can articulate the goals you strive for. And I find if you are conscious of it, then it becomes much clearer what you do. You can do it again on all, all levels. And the quality evaluator is meant to provide an, 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 a method to evaluate uh, in a consistent manner, which I think will be ultimately crucial for, say, social corporations or for governmental institutions or foundations, but also for uh, professional organizations and in the end for also for, um, um, for individuals and for governments. Has anyone ever approached you regarding what you had just said there, once you become more conscious of it, you become better at it. But if somebody wasn't really aware of them, they, they should be a good father or a good mother or, you know, good to society. It was kind of a natural thing to do anyway. But if they became aware of it, that they need to be this, could it be a problem where you could become quite self-critical of, critical of yourself because you are striving now to be better than what you were previously, even though that was considered good enough as such. Yeah. So you see, uh, this sounds kind of strange when I mean, you were here because uh, it's, that's the accusation that I have uh, get is that sort of sounds like a self-help uh, thing, but it is not. Um, although it could have that, that outcome. But I think the mistake is that we approach science as if it is explanatory and predicting. Hmm. Uh, that's what we usually think. But I follow Richard Rorty, who uh, suggests that science, uh, scientific pursuit is first therapeutic in the sense that it raises questions that sometimes uncomfortable. Uh, why do we do it this way? Uh, why are we trying to seek larger universities or uh, larger corporations? Or why do we have protection or all these sort of also economic issues? And then after you sort of unsettle people with raising the questions and make them question their practices, uh, the scientist, I think, has an edifying task that we provide concepts 
uh, I did extensive study uh, into it, but I found that the big impact of economics as a science is not so much by all the explanations we produce and the predictions that we do, but more in an edifying way that people have benefited a great deal from thinking in terms of markets and about production and about opportunity cost. And so when you sort of uh, go around in, in also in governmental circles, in, in businesses, if you ask what what did you get out of economics, then usually people point out that those concepts, uh, that's the sense-making impact that economics have, big, very big. Uh, what I try to do is change that, the sense-making, and try to call attention by using different concepts like shared goods uh, and shared practices to, to point people at things that they otherwise may overlook. Uh, you talked about the ecology. Well, uh, that um, if people, economists talk about the ecology, about the environment and so on, then quickly, before you know it, you talk about um, pollution rights, markets and so on. But you can also talk about it in sort of a sort of shared practice uh, that people care about their environment and pay, take care of it. Um, and that's more a culture as we take care of our kids, as we take care of our arts, as we take care of our sciences. And then you get a very different way of thinking and different approach. And then also, in the end, also different policy. Uh, that, 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 that policy making is not a matter of organizing markets, but also maybe organizing society or stimulating um, reci reciprocal uh, relationships uh, among people. Um, and, and, and then you get a very different emphasis uh, and ultimately also, uh, I think, uh, other types of policies. There's a couple of words being – or a number of books are being written at the moment – like Ikegai, I think it is, in Japan. And then yeah. you have the Hoge in Norway. And these are like um, approaches to how to live well or how to live the Norwegian life or how to live um, with a minimalist attitude or uh, appreciate uh, things that you have. And it's only from, I, I read the Ikegai or Ikegai, I think it's correctly pronounced, I'm not sure. But how in, in Japan, Japanese culture, for example, that when the leaves fall from a tree, there are people that um, are employed. I'm sure they're employed to sweep those gently back to the to the uh, the bark of the tree or to the base of the tree, so that these leaves can decompose and be brought back into the cycle of things. Yeah. and feed the roots. Whereas in here in Ireland, I'm sure in the Netherlands and in most other countries. Do, you know, we just let the wind uh, carry those leaves wherever we might um, yeah. blast them up and and burn them, whatever it is. So we have a different perception of how we should manage earth and give back what we actually receive from them. And is this something that you would be uh, that you would look at uh, and try and look at comparisons in a, from an international perspective on culture and how industries or companies can adapt right. some of your framework because we know we, uh, there are perennial companies in Japan that are uh, have are, are dynasties that are hundreds of years old and they still stay within the family and they're still producing the product whether it is sake or um, textiles or they are forgers and they still have bring those tra cultures and those family traditions and pass them on from one member to the next. Yeah, yeah. Fas Japanese culture uh, fascinates me, uh, especially for these kind of contrast, um, and it shows the the the, the big the, the big role that culture plays. I, I think that economies ultimately are bedded in culture, so even interaction stores are influenced by it. Um, if you go to a Japanese store, uh, the store uh, the um, the people working there have to bow before they enter because they pay their respect to the customer. Um, if you walk around there in the metro, I uh, actually by chance did that experiment without being aware of it, but try just to, to drop a piece of paper. Um, you won't be able to, you don't succeed unless there's no one around. 
but there will be two Japanese pointing at you, uh, p- telling you that you lost something, and two others are, will busy be picking it up. It's simply very hard uh, to to drop something, and therefore you see these uh, metros are uh, very clean. But you see it also in the food culture; uh, they spend a lot of money on the food on their food uh, because they see food as as medicine. So they care very much about the quality of the food. Very few people are fat because that's also uh, something that we won't appreciate, but an incredible social control. Um, and so there's a, this, this society functions very different from ours. And then you become aware of the culture factor. I lived a long time in the United States, um, and I'm sure that you in Ireland um, also find out if you go to another country, you discover how Irish you are, as I discovered um, um, so, um, uh, that I discovered how, um, how Dutch I was by going to Japan and the United States. And that is, uh, I, I just finished a whole article about it, the, the interaction between culture and economy. This is very powerful. Only uh, causations are, uh, and I looked at all the research basically that has been done on it. It's very hard to establish causation um, because it is complex. And that's the other thing is um, what some economists then try to make it into is an instrument uh, for policy. But that's difficult because culture is it doesn't have knobs you can turn on uh, so to make people more aware or less aware. That, that's not how it works. So for an instrumentalist approach, it is not all that helpful. But it is very helpful to understand why people behave in a certain way and where certain actions in that setting are simply not going to work uh, because of the cultural context. So whether you run a company or you run a society or you run uh, your own life, you have to take culture into account. Hmm. I I, I just wonder, it's something I would be very interested in to look at the, the cultural aspects of economics or how to explore the economy with culture being the the underlying reason to where we are at the moment in terms of our uh, economy is some i suppose it's something that i touched on in a recent podcast episode that where does our economy begin does it begin with you know the the supply and demand of a product or does it go way beyond that uh, in terms of the resources that the earth give us uh, and i think you mentioned at the beginning it was it i pencil or did you mention yeah. yeah at the beginning so you know when you look at that story about how the pencil is made or the you know so where where does all that begin and how do you value this particular culture and i i, I this is a book that you've written actually the value of culture and you have a, a nice cover to it the painting of dr gachet by yeah. um, vincent van gogh and I, when i was in america i mentioned van gogh and they said no they didn't understand they said it's van gogh now you give it yeah. that you're dutch is a van gogh or van gogh it's a, it, in dutch it is van gogh okay van gogh you cannot say because that's sort of uh this guttural sounds is, is sort of typical Dutch, but uh, but that's the, the the Dutch pronunciation. Okay, okay. So but you're quite right. I mean, yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, I, I still like the title of the book, "The Value of Culture," because culture has a value and has also a price. Um, but soon has a value. But to come back to your point, how does it all start? See, when you define economics as uh, scarcity. Um, and choice and economists always go back to Robinson Crusoe but it's kind of strange because Robinson Crusoe uh, ends up on this island and leaves money behind because it has no use for him he takes the um, um, uh, uh, the tools because he needs the tools and the money is is, uh, is worthless to him and um, but what and indeed he has to make choices right to to uh, to grow uh, uh, wheat for later use and so on, and to build a shelter that will uh, keep, keep, uh, give him coverage for uh, some time to come. But what is also a big part of that story is that he also seeks company and he sees a chance when he sort of frees, uh, 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 saves uh, Friday uh, from being uh, the main dish on a deal in the meal. And what then so it turns out that he is really sort of trying to uh, develop companionship. That's a shared good, as I mentioned. But what also is never mentioned by economists is that 
he is trying to actually has an issue with his father and is an issue with his face. He actually took three Bibles with him to uh, the island and he's seeking his father and he's seeking God. That's really what this is all about. So I say, taking this as an example, that economics is not so much about uh, solving a uh, problem of scarcity, but it is realizing values, trying to sort of valorize what's important to you. Uh, like in his case, uh, companionship, of course, survival too, but that he needed to do in order to do the things that are important, finding his father, finding God. And that's apparently was important for Robinson Crusoe. And if you interpret that story in that way, you get a different story than what economists make of it. And I, there is a meaning, there's a metaphor to that story. I can actually, when when you're telling me that the synopsis of it there, I can see that this is something that could represent somebody experiencing like an existential crisis in their life. Yeah. That they come to a point where they've, they've like, you often hear young people saying, oh, I can't wait to earn money. I want to buy this, I want to buy that. But then it gets to the point, if you fast forward, maybe 15, 20 years later, that doesn't really ne- matter anymore. You know, you, you think, well, what value do I have? Going back to what you were talking about earlier on, what value can I bring? Um, you know, for say, for, say, for example, there personally about two years ago, I was thinking what I missed out on for the last 50, for the last 25 years was I missed painting and drawing. I was, really? I was okay. I, I was good. I was good. Um, and I was, I was a good artist. And I, I had one couple of competitions and national competitions here in Ireland. But as part of the schooling here, I was given a choice um, uh, because it was a relatively small school. I was given a choice between French and art. And I was told that you need French for college and whatever. So I decided, right, I'll do French. I'll drop art. And it was the last time I really I, I painted and really? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, two years ago, I decided to pick up the pencil. And the first drawing I did was of uh, Virginia Woolf. Oh, really? And it was just a, it was a pencil drawing. And I don't know why I chose Virginia Woolf. I think I took a side, side, a side profile picture from my phone and I drew from that. And I just realized how meditative that was and how I, it was more me rather than the academic side of things. That I, I like that little bit of escapism and that bit of time. And I can value what artists have said about, you know, ha- what the meaning of their work that even though I didn't do this for a price and I wasn't looking for a price, um, but I can understand where artists are coming from. And you, I'm, I'm, you, I, would you consider yourself an artist in terms of your writing and your books? And how you value that and what are you putting out there was not more of a monetary incentive, but more about getting exposure of this subject and this subject matter to other people. Yeah, I really like writing and I recognize your story by the way too about uh, drawing. Um, I just uh, happened to see this movie uh, by Selinger, uh, famous for the catch in the right. Okay. And the movie is called Rebel and Right. And what is intriguing, I, sh- I tried to sh- tell it shortly because it sort of illustrates this. Uh, the guy wanted to write, uh, write stories. And he had to overcome a lot of resistance and prove that he was a writer. And finally, sort of produced Catcher in the Rye that most uh, editor, uh, publishers didn't think uh, is worth publishing. But Little Brown decided to go, go ahead with it and it became a big success. And this is the interesting point. After success, he was actually also uh, had a Buddhist teacher uh, who sort of taught him to meditate on what is really important to him. And then he decided, and this is intriguing, what is important to me is writing. But what is not important for me is publishing, being read. So after getting uh, Selinger, uh, ever catching the right published, he, he continued writing, but he never published anything anymore. Okay. And that's sort of, and most people hearing you said that doesn't make sense. But in, for him, that made perfect sense. Uh, because what he really was, like you drawing this uh, picture of his and you, Wolf, that gives you satisfaction in uh, for yourself. And you said it's meditative. And that's, if you uh, talk with real craftspeople, and it can be a carpenter or an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, a painter or uh, uh, a roof worker or a dentist, you will, or a teacher, uh, they always say they do it for the pleasure of doing it. 
and they get satisfaction of doing it well. And all the rest is secondary. So including appreciation you get, the money you get paid for it, that's secondary. At least that's what real craftsperson will, uh, people will tell you. And um, and then you find, and that is that lots of people engage in activities in their free time, uh, playing soccer, playing the guitar, writing novels. In the Netherlands, there are apparently two million people writing novels in their free time. Chance of being published or recognized is, is uh, zilch, but they will still do it um, simply because they enjoy doing it and they enjoy developing their skills. And that is sort of what I call these practices that people engage in that are meaningful in and of themselves. Mm. And I, I think if you want to have a complete picture of the economy, all that should be part of it. Because it adds also, uh, uh, in its, it, it sort of has also consequences of what we consider to be richness and poverty. And typical for economists, we think that richness, and most people think that too, that richness is a matter of having a lot of money and poverty having little money or no money. But that's that's that doesn't make sense if you think broader, because if you have uh, the skill of drawing, that is part of your richness. If you have the skill of uh, being able to have insight about the economy, that's also part of your richness. So economists could call that still human or cultural capital. Uh, but uh, having a nice family is part of your richness. And what we discover, um, that poverty is not necessarily always a an, an consequence of having little money. That the money is usually the consequence of lacking uh, uh, shared goods, like families, like a nice neighborhood, like good friends. Uh, so the, the causation is, is, is the other way around. At least if you start looking through the lenses that I uh, uh, propagate here. Uh, have you ever explored the origins of culture or the origins of culture within a country? For example, we could stereotype certain countries. Like if I said Russia, someone might think yeah. straight away ballet, uh, music. And then if you want to be a ballet dancer, you would look to go to a Russian school because you yeah. would consider they to be the best because culturally they're rich in that activity. Whereas if you wanted to be an artist, you might like to go to a school in Paris or if you want to be an actor, you go to a school in New York and you look for the best if this is, if this is your stereotypical uh, outlook in terms of uh, if you want to define uh, best t- you would be stereotyping these particular countries, but how does how does Russia become the the best or associated with ballet? Uh, I don't know what the stereotype would be for Ireland, or if there is one for the Netherlands. Uh, Ireland, um, I can tell you what. Uh, maybe for you as an Irish, uh, it's hard to detect, but I like to go to Ireland. Uh, why do we like to go to Ireland? One, the music that people share. Yeah. But most of all is the art of conversation. Yes. I don't know any people who are so skilled in conversing um, in a spontaneous way, in an intelligent, clever, humorous, uh, probing way as, as the Irish. I mean, I have, have conversations with you guys that I have, have not had in any other place. Wow. And in all kinds of ways, you guys are superior to, I love conversation, but uh, the couple of experiences I have in Ireland, I mean, they blew me away. You have an uh, incredible uh, stamina for it. And also an incredible uh, rich uh, reservoir of of topics, of arguments, or what what you also need metaphors, stories to make a conversation rich. So that's what I would consider to be typical uh, a characteristic of of Ireland. But uh, yeah, how does it come about? Um, I actually, with an, a PhD student of mine, uh, we de- develop a sort of an, an way to sort of uh, using big data to see whether you can characterize um, uh, cities, also neighborhoods, and so uh, that you can see what kind of qualities you see in certain neighborhoods. And then you see indeed this, that, that uh, if you are interested in dance or if you are interested in jazz or if you're interested in good conversation, uh, that certain neighborhoods uh, are much better than others or certain cities are much better than others. Um, but you ask also the question, how does it come about? And that's a very hard story to tell. 
if you trace it, I did a McCloskey sort of did an interesting study, I thought, of uh, the rise of bourgeois virtues. Yes. And he saw that happening in, in 16th, 17th century uh, Holland, right? Sort of uh, because they were liberating themselves from the Spaniards, uh, the Spaniards. And in this sort of vacuum, sort of a whole new culture came about, at least in her analysis. But she is very sort of careful not to make too much, too many, too many calls or claims, as Max Weber does, a tribute to Protestantism. But if that's true, what caused Protestantism com- to come about uh, in this part of the world? And why, uh, and if you attribute uh, Japanese culture to Confucianism, uh, the question is then how do we explain the situation in the 19th century? Because then Confucianism was stronger even than it is now. So you have to be very careful with these kind of causal explanations. But I'm always fascinated by these sort of historical studies, trying to trace how sort of uh, culture patterns sort of clustered and, and sort of got solidified. Uh, sometimes we talk about memes, uh, that, that, that culture has memes like genes, uh, like uh, memes, I think you could say it in English, uh, that, that are transferred. Because if you go uh, come to the Netherlands, you will discover that the Dutch have certain characteristics that they don't recognize themselves. But here, a sort of a sacred term is collaboration. Uh, if you have trouble, we collaborate. Okay. Uh, and, and that comes, actually, we think, from the time that we had to fight the water. And fighting the water is only possible if you collaborate. There's no sense of uh, me as a single farmer fighting the water because I don't stand a chance. But only if I, I get all the farmers in the neighborhood together and we sort of start working on these dikes, we, we stand a chance. So collaboration was sort of an our way of surviving, and that's and these are memes that are being transferred uh, till today. So that explains part of our character. Yeah, because th- this culture gives us identity. Yeah, and then that has value in itself. If we can value that, if we can see that, we can value that, or other people sure. will value that, and hence we may be inclined to go to a certain country as a tourist like you would to Ireland if that was your reason for going because you have that positive experience and you like to experience that again or you know if you go here you'll be able to um, enjoy that moment that's right and likewise that's, other countries yeah that, so that's the reason why you go to certain countries why I, why I like to go to Ireland because I like the culture and the people um, but um what is not what we see now is that there are big cultural clashes. Uh, I mean, you're part of that. Uh, this, uh, the Brexit is there, uh, a good expression of that. But also what happens in the United States, what's sort of my second country, uh, that's a real uh, cultural clash. Mm. Uh, it, at first, it was a clash with sort of uh, between West and the East. But now you see how the clash manifests itself within countries. And that's really sort of upsetting because we don't know where it goes. But it shows, especially in the United States, it has a big economic impact. Yes. Yeah. The measures that, that, that Trump takes uh, fly in the face of what any uh, economist would say. But it gets a great sort of, it resonates and gets a strong response from big uh, groups of people in the United States who think this is the right thing to do. And uh, to to show uh, the Chinese off and to uh, impose all these uh, 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 tariffs and so on, and and so and that's why I tell talk with, when I talk with my economic colleagues say uh, if you are interested in how economies perform, we should include that just especially now. It should be something we have to take into consideration and in some way take into account in our models. Uh, of course, I don't get a very uh, positive response. And the reason is that it is very hard to capture these complex phenomena into variables. Yes. To figure out the parameter, parameters that you can quantify. And so then I say, yeah, if that's so, there's not a reason there for dismiss it, but maybe change our approach. And then I come back to the therapeutic and the edifying. And so that it come, could be that our approach, just like it was for Keynes and, and Smith, but also Milton Friedman, more qualitative. And I yeah, talk Hayek and I can mention a whole bunch of people who actually were more qualitative um, rather than in this sort of uh, appearance of, of precision that we get with these mathematical models that are so popular still today. Um, 
but that in order to make sense of the economy, we have to pay attention to, yeah, for example, the cultural factor. Is this um, what, is this once is this popularity of mathematics is that waning? Is there more value be given to the type of work that you are mentioning there regarding? the qualitative approach to things because people are, I I have a sense anyway that academics are now uh, going through what Smith and Hayek are, have been writing about in Keynes earlier on as well. And that tends to be more the work that's being done at the moment, or people are maybe if they have tenured positions are allowed to break away from what's expected and do their thing that connects to these classical economists and John Merlin Keynes and Hayek. Yeah, I'm not so sure about it. Okay. I did this research with David Kohlander in the, um, the late eighties, um, among graduate students. And we really, we got into the economist among others with, because every, people were astounded by the outcomes because uh, these graduate students said that mathematics, uh, sol- problem solving skills were far more important than knowing something about the economy, which they thought was quite irrelevant for economists. That blew the minds of journalists. They said, well, the point of economics is to know the economy. No, no, said the students. Uh, their marching order was clearly to focus on uh, problem solving skills. Empirical research was not very popular. So, and then the, the, uh, the, the, the discipline took action. There was a committee and so on. And David Kohler said, okay, that's great. Now there's more focus on, on history and good writing, on, on sort of the context in which economies operate, culture maybe. But the response was just the opposite. Uh, criteria for admission become tougher and more focused on mathematical skills. So there will be less dissent. So it took a turn, I thought, for the worse. Um, and what we see also in the Netherlands, I don't know how it is in Ireland, uh, but throughout Europe, you see actually that this sort of American way is still prevailing. Now, there are exceptions that you mentioned. But I find, uh, at least in um, in Dutch uh, faculties, that um, uh, the, although some history of thought is taught, uh, the philosophy of economics is not taught. Uh, that uh, when I talk to graduate students and ask them about uh, have philosophy of science, it's just like they are thrown back uh, a few hundred uh, years ago in ter- terms of their understanding. And uh, so I'm not sure... Um, and that's rather disappointing to observe that we made a great deal of progress in that regard. Mm. And they are just like the students we inter- invest, uh, interviewed then. Uh, they are very mo- much focused on, on yeah, the, the modeling. And uh, now in behavioral economics, that is changing somewhat. Uh, you have some, uh, but actually that too is just a commentary or critique on, of course, ch- rational choice models without providing much of an alternative. Are you? Can I ask you a number of quick fire questions before yeah, sure. we wrap up? I, you mentioned Coleman there. This is not uh, the Coleman that wrote the book on emotional intelligence, is it? The same person? Uh, no, I think I mentioned someone else, but. Uh, okay, your but, student but, from but, the 80s, no? Yeah, but, but uh, Nick, uh, this is Coleman there I mentioned. Oh, sorry. Oh, but sorry. Coleman, but I know the book that you're referring to. Okay. And I think that's interesting. Do you have any book that you'd like to recommend or what's, what book has actually um, be made a, the most impression on you as, a, as an academic or as someone who's well culturally read? Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of books that come on, to my mind. Uh, but if I stick to sort of more uh, the economics, um, uh, the books of my friend uh, Deirdre McCloskey, Bourgeois Virtues, um, Keynes is a favorite, especially uh, um, a, f- a few essays of his and the chapter 12 general theory um, was quite a revelation to me. And, um, and strangely enough, yeah, for me, an important source is Aristotle. Okay. And I get, um, uh, I, I draw quite a bit from Aristotle as a source, especially the Ethica uh, Nic- Nicomacheus. The, is the cha- chapter 12 in Keynes' general theory on animal spirits, or would that be something else? Yeah, that is, uh, yeah it's, I sometimes thought uh, of publishing chapter 12s uh, uh, without telling that it was from Keynes, because if you read chapter 12, it's just like he addresses the current time. 
Do you know? It's, yeah. And so it's very insightful. And it's unbelievable that he wrote that in the 30s and it still uh, is valid and still gives you all kinds of uh, important ideas. His work, uh, that chapter 12, was largely dismissed by economists at the time because it yeah. wasn't seen as part of the economic science or the direction in which the, the science was going. And it felt it was very much philosophical or something that is too soft to be considered as a hard subject. And it was largely dismissed. And it was yep. only recently that it got a revival through Ackerlofsch and Schiller's um, Animal Spirits, again, yep. for for the mainstream or for people who would have not really known about this, which is un unfortunate because we could have gone a long way if people used this as a, a groundbreaking move in that direction or to continue on the direction of Adam Smith through this whole idea about Animal Spirits. Uh, animal spirits. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I got also this through Axel Lion Hoofwood and Bob Clower, to mention a few, who sort of, uh, I was a student and they alerted me to this. So that's how I got interested in it. And I still remember buying uh, the general theory when I was a student and how this was such an uh, such a big moment in my life to carry this book, the general theory, and to discover that I could read it. And uh, although it's only later that I realized how relevant that chapter 12 is for me. Are you, um, you're, you're well written in terms of the amount of publications and books that you have. Would you like to share with us maybe about two or three writing tips you could um, sh advise people who are maybe in the middle of writing and are struggling or who, who want to explore how other people are kind of creative in that space? Yeah. I, um, one advice I give my students is um, it's always most important how you start, motivation. And then there are also techniques of writing. Uh, we all know uh, that uh, I do uh, the, the writer's block, that you don't succeed in writing. And I have found out that that has a function. Because if you have trouble writing, there is something that's blocking you. And you have to figure out what is blocking you. And usually that's significant. So that, that, and then you have to do the work. And what I do myself, and that gives me most pleasure, is um, I make sure when I'm in the writing mode, so I know basically what I want to write, I create a space. I prefer actually to be away from my home so that my wife and my kids are not troubling me. And I try to create a space where I can all be by myself and follow the rhythm of my body but especially for the rhythm of my writing. So uh, first day is usually the last, second day I get going, and the third day it is incredibly productive. And um, and then it sort of pours into the computer, or what I sometimes do also, write, take a yellow pad and sit in a cafe and write there. I found that actually in some way that works better than writing into a computer. And those are the high points in my life. That um, And then you sort of... Uh, if I think about doing the right thing, that's how I, I uh, big chunks of the book I wrote that way. And then yeah, that's incredibly satisfaction, uh, gives a great deal of satisfaction to write that way. But yeah, it is an, um, it is a, it is an, uh, a skill. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you have to work hard at it. I was not a good writer at first, but I really had to work at it. And now I love it. Uh, Aria, what's the fascination with yellow paper? Because uh, a lot of writers that I've uh, heard and read about would do actually like the yellow paper. Is it because the white paper isn't as reflective on the light and yeah. it's easier on the eyes? Yeah, they sort of you buy it's sort of in the United States you have the yellow pads. Okay. And for some reason, they work better for me than uh, white paper. White paper is rather um, harsh in a way. Yeah. And yellow is softer. I don't know. It's more inviting. Okay. Uh, maybe, but I, 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 to be honest, I, I wouldn't actually know why. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I always take yellow pa yellow pads uh, with me when I come from the United States. Okay. One more question, if you don't mind, Ario. I know um, we've been on it for just over an hour now. But if you could step into the DeLorean and time travel, um, what year would you like to go back to and who would you like to speak to? Now, that is not so difficult a question. I would love to go back to uh, to Athens 300 years, 350 years before Christ and sort of walk my way to Academos, the, the garden of the academy, 
of academos and get into conversation with the philosophers there. Very nice. Uh, that 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 would be quite something. And you've had many conversations. You even have a book now cons- uh, from I think was um, one of your first books, conversations yeah. with economists. And um, to be honest, I, I love talking to you, Ario. I'd love to be continuing this conversation because there is a, a lot of personal interest in the type of work that you do. And I'd love to be able to explore it a lot more. And even the, the types of work that you do with the Center for Research in Arts Economics and all of these extra activities that you were um, trying, you, you were part of, like the Crafts Council, um, Philosophy East West and ac- academia, you know, there's a, a lot that actually um, is building up this idea that culture and art is very evident and should be much appreciated in economics. And I'd love to recommend your website, claimer.nl, that's K-L-A-M-E-R. And if anybody wants to find all the links and books and resources mentioned by yourself, Ario, yeah. they can go to my website, economicrockstar.com forward slash Ario Claimer. That's A-R-J-O-K-L-A-M-E-R. Ario, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I had a really great time having that conversation. Um, you almost gave me a little a bit of bit of a big head when you um, talked about Ireland at that at, at that point. But um, really appreciate it, and I'd like to say you are an economic yep. rock star. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you, and hopefully we can carry on uh, the conversation in uh, in Ireland. I would love that. I would look you up if I have a chance. Yeah, that'd be great. And I'll, I'll definitely be in touch. And if there's any other episode that we, you might like to be part of in the future, it's okay to reach out to you if you have sure. other writings on the, uh, in the future, yeah? Sure. I'll share that with you. Fantastic. Thanks right. very much. And if you ever see Deirdre, you can tell her I said hello. She probably doesn't remember, okay. but... <laughs> she probably does. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanking you. Bye. 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 Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the economic rockstar website if you enjoy this podcast why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economic rockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the economic rockstar community if you're listening to this episode on itunes or stitcher radio i would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.